Shinji and Warhammer 40k, Chapter 9, An End to Peace, Part 2. Misato was giddy when they didn't return that night. She was ready for a whole load of teasing and accusations when they came through her door. It only intensified when the two didn't arrive by morning. By midday, she was worried. By sunset, she was ready to kill a whole lot of people. You lost them? How could you just lose one of the most important people on this planet like that? Captain Katsuragi, other than avoiding notice from other civilians, Pilot Akari has so far been very cooperative with our surveillance. We give him as much privacy as he needs. We don't follow him indoors, for example, nor do we monitor his conversations, was the Section 2 Chief's icy reply. There are moments when we simply lose sight of him, despite our efforts to the contrary. But he always just shows up soon and unharmed later. Sometimes he even tracks us down to apologise. This time, three of my people are dead. That's why we didn't know he was just gone. So, it was deliberate. Kidnapping? Possibly. We haven't received any demands yet, but since both Pilot Akari and Lieutenant Ibuki are missing, we can rule out random attacks or assassination. Misato winced at that last word. Rest assured, Captain. We're doing our very best to track him down. Does his father know yet? The bland, sunglass man nodded. Yes, we've informed Commander Akari of the events. Well, whatever he said, make it double from me. You'd better not fail. Actually, he didn't threaten us at all. Masato looked disbelieving. Then, finally... That bastard! There was no reply from the Section 2 chief. That was the furthest he was allowed to express his own dissatisfaction. There were very few in Nerve who disliked Pilot Curry, if simply because he offered, offered such a contrast to his father. Given the levels of sheer dastardly vibes Gendo could exude, by comparison, Shinji was all but the second coming. It was also no secret that father and son both pissed each other off on some fundamental unseen level. Nerve was in a panic. They tried to keep a tight lid on it, but it was inevitable the situation got out. And when Nerve is in a panic, the JSSDF goes into epileptic fits. Eventually, the news even reached the Strategic Defence Ministry. What the hell's wrong with those morons at Nerve? Now they lose the only person in that place that actually has any shred of competence? Was the general idea. We'd better not have anything to do with this, growled out the general that supported the jet alone project's absorption into the Nerve supply infrastructure. Of course not, sir, one of the lesser officers replied. I mean... Why would we? We already have Master Carrie's cooperation, and frankly, he serves us best over there, right, with his Ange Evangelion. The entire military intelligence network went active, but furtively. If the media got wind of it, the entire nation would freak out. The army itself prepared to mobilise at an instant's notice. Whoever kidnapped Pilot Akari could be anyone, from a splinter group within the JSSDF up all the way up to another nation. Everyone searched, but found no immediate clues. They were shoved into a small room with a bed. So far they hadn't been restrained as the kidnappers attempted to maintain some measure of civility. Maya was very frightened, but leached off some emotional control from the simply unnatural calm that Shinji exuded. You can't possibly be expecting to get away with this, he said. I mean, you didn't even bother to take us out of the city boundary. The leader of the group, whom Shinji had started to dub Pointy Beard due to the spindly growth under his nose, smirked. And why do you think you know that? Seriously, black suits, black van, you can't paint yourself any more suspicious to the JSSDF patrols outside. Inside Tokyo 3, the black suit and sunglasses can get you anywhere. Everybody knows that's nerve spook and this is a nerve town. The pilot shook his head. People both respect and fear it. Another kidnapper, who in Shinji's mind was babyface since he looked the youngest, made a sucking sound. How long did it take upstairs to figure that out? This kid's smart. Maybe too smart. Is it okay if we just let him see our faces? Asked another, dubbed Red Nose for an obvious reason. Why not? Answered Pointy Beard. After all, we're going to be very real good friends soon. Won't we, Mr. Akari? You want me to work for you? Shinji replied dully. That's or you don't expect me to live long enough to remember your faces. You'd best have an Evangelion then. That's not as much of a problem as you may think, Mr. Akari. Then let Maya-san go. She has nothing to do with this. The men in black suits laughed. You don't really expect us to comply, right? 
I suppose we could let her loose, but then shoot her in the back to keep her from running to nerve. Pointy Beard laughed. Or we could get bored. Maya's eyes widened in fear at the implication. Shinji narrowed his. Fine, I'll cooperate. Treat her as a princess and I'll treat your words as that of a prince. Pointy Beard had a face that was easy to remember, but at the same time impossible to find. Once he shaved off that distinctive facial mark, which would stick in people's minds, he could be anyone among millions. It was this that made Shinji decide he was the most dangerous, and the focus for all his counter -psych. Well said, Mr. Ikari. He was obviously pleased. Let's see how long we can upload this deal. Rika Zuna was in her element. The disappearance of Shinji Ikari was a major scoop, and it was she that broke it to the public. It was done simply by her seeing a worried look in Masato's face, in one of her cameraman's many candid shots. From there she began an interview of others in the building, careful to do so without approaching the building itself. Simple enough, all it took was a look through the telephone directory. She could be very ingratiating when she needed to be, and thus she learned that while the residents no longer took any special notice of Shinji Ikari's coming and goings, they knew his visitors. Maya Buki hasn't been seen go any more going into Misato Katsuragi's place, when it was known she ate there almost every day. A little bit of research, and there she is. Maya Buki. High grades, works at Nerve, no real social life to speak of. Now, Misato could simply have been worried about her subordinate, and it was the weekend. Rika tapped her pencil on the screen and grinned. Now whose personality profile did this remind her of? By Monday she was ready with a lurid tale of escape and forbidden fruits. Incidentally, Shinji Kari didn't show up at school that day. Or the day after that. Half a week passed and she brought speculations to the limit. Rika Izuna reporting here, asking questions there. Rika Izuna, the one who saw it first, giving you the truths they're trying to hide. Damn it, Masato, you can't shoot her, Ritsuko snapped. But the things they say about Shinji-kun and Mai-chan, you can't seriously say you're not angry too. Masato put her head to the desk and groaned. If it was just that, I'd be okay. But she has no right to make up all these lies. After all the things Shinji-kun has done for this city, he deserves more than this crap. Unsightly as it is, Nerve has no choice but to let it go on, even subtly encourage it. It's better than having it be known he might be the hostage of a foreign power. Who do you think? The Americans are closest to having a new fully functional Evangelion. The German branch already has its own Avron pilot. China's project has effectively stalled and they're reduced now to manufacturing spare parts for our Avers. Ritzko shrugged. Of course, that's all too obvious. It could be any number of other factions. She lit up another cigarette. Damn the boy. Maya was more important. She had access to the magi and most of the Evangelion files. Shinji's effect was mostly on the moral side. Maya opened up a direct attack upon Nerve itself. Besides, the bridge of Nerve seemed all the more dreary without her naive influence. Rokoto's fumbling and Shinji Shigeru's nihilism tried, but just couldn't compare. Of all the smoke coming out of her, Gendo had thankfully been absent in his attentions. Good. Because he'd so, if he'd so much as asked for it in a harried state, Ritsuko knew she wouldn't be able to resist punching him in the face. Beside her in one of the corner cafeterias of the geo front, Misato sat playing with an unopened can of beer. Her fingers drifted to the tab now and then, only to send the can rolling away. Back again. How she ached to open it up and just let the bad habits blunt the pain. But drunk, she wouldn't be able to search for Shinji. Misato hadn't tasted anything with alcohol for four days straight, which had to be some sort of record. Her home seemed barren, in all its cleanness so unlike her. Misato was forced to go back to instant meals. After all, the daily gourmet cooking in the past months, it was like eating cardboard. Damn it, it hurt. The shock, the loss of her surviving second impact had driven her to silence for years. She could still function in the midst of Shinji's disappearance, but that seemed to cut away a piece of her all the more. She'd never again invested so much of herself into another person, not since Kaji, and Shinji made it easy. He was her family. Always there, always ready to help. Gods! She stabbed her food with her chopsticks. Only then did she realise it. It was like having a husband, only without the sex. What the hell, Shinji? Why must you be so damn meek? A shelter's one thing, a butler's another. 
there was a horrid contrast with how he behaved inside the Ava. It's not right. Not right at all. A butler uniform. Damn. I really should have thought of it earlier. Could have been fun. There was a knocking at the door. Miss Sato wiped her eyes and opened it. There stood Ayanami. Oh, it's you, Ray. Captain Kataragi. She bowed slightly. I come seeking advice. A slight smile crossed Masato's face. Of course, Ray. You should know my home's always open to you. Do you want to talk about Shin-chan, Ray? Ray nodded again and followed her in. Instead of sitting down to join Masato at the table, however, she went right past and into Shinji's room. The nerve captain blinked, confused, and got up to see. There, Ray sat on her knees, facing Shinji's figurines, her head bowed in an expression of such utter emotionless desolation. Masato's heart softened. Odd girl, she whispered sadly, but I guess we have to deal with it in each our own way. She closed the door to give Ray some privacy. Within, Ray thought out, You who have been pilot to carry his companion since you was a child, I seek your advice. She recalled carefully what Shinji had told her, and how their voices had seemed to appear then. Believe, said Shinji, believe they shall speak and they will. Ask and we shall answer, replied the Eldar. The Chaos Marine seemed to grin. For the bright lord, let no door remain closed. Ray took out the war boss and placed it amongst them. She imagined him saying, Hello, you boring grots. Miss me? No, said the farseer, still miffed. We have known each other long enough. That Zeno you may be, I believe I may call you comrade. The space marine seemed to bow. If only your return was not at the behest of such dire circumstances. Well, girl, what do you ask of us? Ray turned to the chaos marine. Shinji Kun has been taken. However, I feel he has not been taken far. How long has it been since you could sense our young king? Always. I do not understand, but it seems as if I have known him. Always. He is still within this city, I am certain of it. However, I am not certain upon how to act upon this knowledge. What have you considered so far, child? The farseer asked gently. I propose we level this city section by section until we find him. I am capable of this, and we can begin within the next hour. I estimate it will only take me two days and four hours until it is completely assured that I have isolated where a carry kun may be. What have you two been doing? The farseer screeched at the raw boss. He laughed coarsely. <laughs> We've been having fun! On the fifth day, a video disc arrived at a Hakone teen TV station. I de- incidentally, one owned by the direct competitor of the media chan Rika Zuna worked for. At precisely noon, all of the TV sets and the big screen displays up on the buildings showed Shinji Akari's face. The producers knew they'd catch flack from not giving Nerve any advance warning, but what the hell? Greetings, people of Tokyo Free, Japan and the world. My name is Shinji Akari. People dropped whatever they were doing, fled lines at fast food restaurants and just halted right down the street. Fortunately, there were no accidents. Nerve had the collective thought of This can't be good. I'm being held under the hospitality of the exalted world society. I'm being treated well, and I'm under no duress to speak this announcement. Shinji looked down apparently at a script, filming with some amused disbelief at someone off the camera. The image flickered and the pilot began speaking again. However, he seemed somewhat groggy. The people of the exalted world deeply regret the necessity of their actions... But my continued well-being cannot be assured unless the following demands are met. The following prisoners are to be freed from SSDF control and given free passage into High Pakistan. Jane Hoffman, Abril Marendu, Dr. Gillian Singh, Dr. Wen Lung Shi, General Peter Burradol, and Ivan Sanford Doe. What? Those in the government could barely believe the utter gall. Those are all top six in the top ten of worst terrorist masterminds in the SSDF list. Letting them loose would be a disaster of apocalyptic proportions. Additionally, a sum of 500 million US dollars are to be deposited 
in a certain account to be revealed later. Shinji looked off screen for a moment and took a deep breath. He looked down to Reed and gasped. You can't be serious, he whispered. This is impossible, insane. The image froze then began again. Though the place was the same, people could tell some time had passed. The circles under Shinji Akari's eyes were that much darker. And Gendo Akari and his crony, Kozo Futsuki, shall immediately be relieved of their command of nerve and be deported from this country to trouble its citizenry no more. Whatever other nation is so foolish to accept them is of no concern. This is non-negotiable. They must leave or the boy will die. Shinji Kari looked up and his eyes were full of hate. This completes the demands. We will not speak this way again. He looked beyond the camera again. There. He's satisfied? Touch her and I will kick! Tokyo Free as if imploded. There was shouting, finger pointing and many, many tears. Rika Zuna could only grit her teeth. In one simple act, Shinji Akari had taken it all away. Her reputation was now permanently damaged. It was as if he existed to take away the joys of simple working people like her. She wouldn't be able to walk the street without being taunted or spat at. This also filled her with aimless anger. She had no pity. It would do the boy good to experience some real-life hardship instead of being treated like a prince at nerve. The obvious nepotism there was the sure sign of a sick society. Wasn't it? Her cameraman made no reply. It was the Nerve Command Center, and up on the tactical holographic matrix, the demand video was played once more. Gendo and Fuyutsuki remained impassive up there on their command section, but those below had reactions mixing murderous rage and anxious fear. What is the current status of the search? asked Fuyutsuki. The Japanese intelligence services have found Lieutenant Mayobuki's wallet in Tokyo too. Makoto tried hard to keep his voice level. Currently, the JSSDF, Internal Affairs and various other groups are cooperating to search the city and its environs. I noticed that we kept Section 2 close to home. It's out of our jurisdiction, Masato put in. Besides, we have reason to believe Shinji is still in this city. As long as we don't make it obvious, we can track down the location if they think we're concentrating far afield. What makes you think this, Captain Katsuragi? Gendo asked blandly. Misato nodded to Makoto, who began to play another recording. She continued. We received this late afternoon yesterday. It's been scanned and it checks out as 100% genuine. It began from... You can't possibly be expecting to get away from this. Everyone there listened impassively as Shinji's situation slowly became clear. The playback was paused a few minutes in by Ritsuko. Someone at some point must have placed the monitoring device on Pilot Akari's clothes, or put it in himself. But surprisingly of all there, only Ritsuko had that thought. Masato? Not me! Why a sound recorder and not a tracking device, I'm not sure. Because Shinji couldn't find the hardware to track his own transponder without tipping off the JSSDF to what he was up to. But it recorded days of signal. Given the storage capacities we have now, this is not unusual. However, someone must have edited it all out, for what we have here are only the most important parts of the recording. This is immediately after the recording of the demands. Shinji's voice was heard, amplified, all around the command centre. I still think you're all insane. My father would never abandon his post at Nerve. Not even for his own son. The other voice was uncharitably amused. Pointy Beard sat behind the camera, smoking a cigarette. Not even for the pilot of an Evangelion. Never. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. It's not his decision. The Japanese government, the masses or the UN will force him out of his position. You have no idea how many people your father pissed off all over the years. Making them all think you're all unstable. This is planned well. Even hitting me was calculated to drive public opinion. His voice grew louder and shrill. Why? Why do this? Right when humanity needs to stand together. You don't really believe all that crap, do you? Saving us from angels. Ha! Crud. No matter what, it's all just politics. 
I've seen the angels. I've fought them. They want us all dead. When all the world is coming together to destroy this unity is suicide. There was a grunt as Shinji tried to turn around while tied to a chair. It doesn't matter how much you hate my father. Nothing's worth your lives and the safety of humanity. Just please, end this foolishness. Let us go and we won't even look back. Laughter. You really sound sincere. I guess that's why you're popular with the kids and the old fools. If I didn't know better, I'd think you were setting up to be even higher than your father. Footsteps. Well, you're going to learn that this is the big game for the big boys. And if you're going to be playing, you've got to be ready with the high stakes. People are not meant to be played with. Really? Do you think so too, Miss Ibuki? There was a muffled sound. Let her go! I did as you asked! Laughter again, but this time for many men. Hey, but it's been days. Such boring days all cooped up in here. It was a different voice. This was someone Shinji dubbed Baldy, though his hair was simply cut very short. Coward! Shinji yelled. You're not even worthy of being called a man! More laughter. Little boy lecturing me on what it means to be a man. There was a loud female whimper over the recorder. Well, did you two even kiss at least once? No. Baldy's hands began to drift down her waist. You think you're strong, but you're not. You believe you have power, but you're weak. Even tied to this chair, I'm more than a man and you'll ever be, faithless coward. Hey, chief. What? Pointy Beard looked over his shoulder. This kid's starting to bore me. Fine. You want him loose? There was a brief silence. The leader took out a knife and cut the scotch tape, pinning Shinji to the chair. As long as the others held Maya, he had no fear of retaliation. Bah! Now step up or shut up, you little bonk. Maya son! Clattering sound, footsteps. Maya son, you look like you can't breathe. Let me help you. Shinji removed her mouth gag. Hey, hey, remember me? There was a meaty frack. The pilot dropped, his face striking the floor hard. Keep your head in the game, lover boy. Ha! I'll get another one like that to it. Shinji kun! I'm fine, Maya son. Shinji spat aside. So be it. He felt a loose tooth. Have at you then. Yeah, that's it, little boy. Show me what you got. <laughs> ah! The muscular goon began to heave for breath as Shinji went directly to punching at his lower ribs. Then, of course, the headbutt. Fuck you! If he was expecting the young man to show any fear or hesitation whatsoever, he was sorely mistaken. You will not! And Shinji kneed him in the face. Hurt Maya-san! The others began to hoot and jeer. Incensed, Baldy looked up and snarled. So that's how you want to play it, huh? He bull-rushed forward and tackled the much lighter young man to the ground. Once there, he began punching at the pilot's face again and again. Shinji's head snapped left and right. Ha! <laughs> How do you like that? shouted Baldy amid the cheers of his peers. Shinji abruptly grabbed at one of the goon's hands, shoved some fingers in his mouth and bit down hard. Baldy screamed. Blood began to pour out of the pilot's mouth. The others rushed to help. They kicked at him, punched at him, forced him to let go. Baldy lay hunched over there, cradling his fingers. He looked up and murder was in his eyes. Pointy Beard moved there between them. Enough. You asked for this. Nobody touches the girl until I say so. He turned towards Shinji, there looking defiant. He gave the pilot a strong, backhanded slap. Know your place. You'll have nothing over us. We owe you nothing. Count yourself lucky that I'm even tolerating you this far. Shinji slumped. Not so tough about your big toy, aren't you? Sneered another goon, who actually was bald but was dubbed Pig's Eye. Another, a tall lanky man that was known as Yellow's Tooth in the mine, said, Me nice and we'll let you have a turn when we're done. That was an awesome freak out. Let's see that again. Shinji said nothing. Nothing more to say? Pointy Beard asked. Go <laughs> What's that? The goons all actually bent closer to here. Morgulov Chaos Axel Sintif! Shinji began to scream. You will all fail. All your little plans torn asunder. You and your masters. I will see to it! 
He got sucker punched in the abdomen. He purposely vomited all over their feet. Morgoloth chaos axes Nogoloth! He snapped his head up and then slammed it into someone's jaw. Touch her and suffer. Suffer and die! Those cuts gone psycho, yelled out Babyface. Then beat some sense into him. Both Yellow's Tooth and Pig's Eye grabbed Shinji's arms and wrestled him into a lock. Pointy Beard grinned and lifted his fist. Just as he was about to strike, the teen spat at his eyes and threw his aim off. It hit Pig's Eye and let the teen loose. Morgul of Chaos Axo Slaneth! Shinji lashed out with his foot and caught Pointy Beard right at the gonads. You will hide and I will find you. You will run and I will always be right behind you! His voice rose too as like a thunder. Mogolos Chaos Axos Kornath! I will see you all in hell! Those in Nerve Command winced as the sounds of a truly painful beating commenced. Someone in the recording shouted, Fuck this! Maybe we should play with you then! I have fought as a god! I have fought as a god! Shinji laughed. You will not frighten me, little man! Crack! Is... Is he dead? Maybe. No, he's still breathing. Hi, what's this? It's... The kid was wired. Nice equipment here. Falls right into his clothes. Damn, no wonder the kid was so mouthy. That jumpers might be some sort of cold. A loud sigh. Get the girl out of here. I'm not in the mood anymore. Nobody gets at her before me. Stupid kid. What should I do with this, Chief? Break it, you fucking moron! Break it! Static. Silence descended heavily into the Nerve Command Center. That is as far as what we have, Ritsuko said calmly. Shinji kun! Masada was at near panic. What do we know from this? We've got to get him and Maya out of there! Well, all that nonsense Shinji was saying could be some sort of code indeed. Of the four words he stressed, I can reasonably guess they are the four cardinal directions. Offhand, I'd say Nergolf is north, Slanef is south, Sintanef is east, and Kornaf is west. Now, the phrases before that were repeated, so I can't assume they're of some coordinate system. Chaos. I have a feeling it means unknown, said Makoto. Changing, unspecified. Yes, it fits, Masato nodded. Shinji won't exactly know where he's being held. Thank you, Hugo-kun. You're welcome, Katsuragi-san. I don't know. As for me, I feel Axos means underground. Misato looked at Ritsuko. Does that make sense? Tokyo 3 is far more complicated underground than above ground. It would be more secure and all that noise could be hidden well. She nodded. It sounds logical. Now all we have to figure out is what Morgoloth means. Anyone? Anyone? Silence. She sighed. Let's hope Section 2 can crack this. It's our only hope right now. Everyone had their own way of dealing with their uselessness in the search for Shinji Akari. Kensuke seemed the most enraged outfit and went off somewhere to vent. Nobody could find him. Toji grumbled about losing two friends in a week and was seen pan- pacing around like a caged bear. Classes attempted to go on as usual and Hikari in her class representative role was far more vicious than normal. As for Ray, it was not a good week to be a rule breaker in Tokyo 3. Hikari felt tired from even the daily rituals. It all felt so strange about Shinji there, even if the city had known him for only so few months. Everything seemed so bleak. Gone was innocent optimism that characterised his stay. Without Toji and Kensuke fooling around, her daily duties were lighter and tedious. She wasn't ashamed to admit she cared for Shinji. He was like a walking paradox of stability in chaos and chaos instability. He was a deep friend who brought her even closer to Toji. Under his influence, she saw Toji grow from a sullen young teen into the dedicated young man he could be. He was intelligent enough that just by hanging around him, Toji too was beginning to craft his own brand of wisdom. She pushed open the door to her home and sighed. Now she actually had competition for Toji. Unlike the others, she wasn't going to do the must-have-them-both dance. Nozomi ran across the hall and latched onto her dress. The little girl pointed deeper into the apartment. Make out the new sign, give it back! Kodama, eldest of the Harakis, poked her head through a vanity window cut into her wall. 
Oi, hi, Hikari, Okari. Her hair, unlike of her sister's, was left to hang free over her shoulders. Though she had the same air of competence as her sister's, having to work to support them had given her a certain playfulness to deal with it all. They can't give it back! Nozomi said again, nearly crying. Hikari sighed. She opened her eyes and gave her elder sibling such a look. Sister, what have you done now? Hey, no fair going inquisitor Haraki on your own family, Konda- complained Kodama. Hikari didn't relent. Finally, Kodama sighed and came out of the hiding. She showed a strange book made out of bond paper sloppily glued together and raised it high up as Nozomi rushed to grab it. Oh, come on, she said to the youngest. You should be glad I actually deem anything of yours as interesting. Give it, sis! That's not for you! Fish, let me photocopy it and I'll never bother you again. If anything, the zombie became even more horrified. No way! The book is supposed to be for us kids and only us kids can make it! That's cheating! It's not for you, biggins! Her eyes began to tear up. Just because you're bigger doesn't mean you can just steal! She started to wail. Kodama winced at that. Having read to that part of the book, she knew it was the harshest condemnation the kids could bring to bear. And it was justified. She was inches away from being mobbed. Okay, okay, here. No! You want it and you got it! Nozomi looked up, her face all scrunched up in seriousness. If she's willing to steal from your own sister, then I respect you need. Don't wait, Kodama Nichan. It's not proper to stop of the week. I'm not, I'm not, I'm sorry. She began to push the book as if it might poison her, or Nozomi just as unwilling to accept it. Hikari's irritation faded into gentle amusement. What's all this about anyway? She asked. I'm giving it to Hikari, is that okay? Kadama looked begging. Is it all right? Nozomi paused. Well, Hikari Nietzsche does work for, with, Hikari corrected. With Shinji-sama, it's okay for her to read it. She crossed her arms cutely again. The only proper way for any of you big and snow the book is to hear it. If she wants the book, then you better be ready to live it too. Live it? That made Hikari curious and a little apprehensive. What have you been up to, Nozomi-chan? She took the book and began to flip through it. This is... Kadama nodded at the expression on her sister's face. Yep. That's what I thought at first, too. It's written in both some form of English and very basic Japanese. And in crayon. Now why would these children go to all that trouble? Hikari began to read out loud. In the beginning, the boss was walking down... No, 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 give me! Nozomi reached out for the book. That's the problem with you brigands. This is why we don't yet use read it. He doesn't know how to read it proper. Hikari winced at the mangled words. Please, please use proper speech, Nozomi-chan. Proper? Ha! You biggins make all sorts of rules of what's proper and not to forget about the simple things. Instead of making everybody happy, you just make all sad. We spectate about rules. I like nothing about who's better. This is what's proper. She took a deep breath and read properly. In the beginning, the boss was walking down this road, see. Some people take the low road. Some people take the high road. Some take the easy ones others already walked through, while others make their own roads. The boss walked his own road, and this three were following him without his knowings. There was round boy and thin boy and short boy. They shouted out to the boss to stop, and he did. They made fun of the boss, saying he was small and weak. They wanted the boss's stuff. Cause they was bigger. There was no one else on that road and the boss was silly to go where no one would hear him and help. They wanted to push him around cause it was fun. And the boss said, You think you're strong but you're not. You think you got power cause you got numbers but you don't. You got no respect for others because you think it's enough that you respect yourselves. And he gave them such a thump. I says you don't have any respect, not for yourselves, not for anyone's. You don't got the strength, you don't got the power, no one's going to respect you. You ain't strong. 
the ground boy asked. Yes, yeah, strong. How do we become strong? You become strong through respect. Fear is weak. It's not enough. It eats at you, but respect feeds you. Respect makes you stronger. What is this respect, you ask? It's the knowing. The use of strength is to protect the weak. The worth of power is to protect that which is right and true. And the weak can be strong where they need to be. Do you get it? They got it. And that was how Round Boy, Thin Boy and Short Boy became the boys. Nozomi shut her eyes, closed the book and exhaled. She smiled with self-satisfaction as she looked up again. That's how it's supposed to be read. What's proper is what's real. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Keep to what's real. She gave the book back to her elder sister. That was... Hikari took it, her hand slightly shaking. Where did you get this, Nozomi-chan? The little girl shrugged. Made it. That's how the book's supposed to be. You ain't set the boys until you makes the book with your own hands. But there's like 50 pages of this thing, Kadama pointed out. And you're a girl. The boss said respect the girls at the mark because they're going to be mean and tougher than a whole lot to your guts. I'm not going to help you when you get stumps for doing or saying something stupid. We're just going to laugh and point fingers at you. Kadama laughed. How ironic. Feminism rampant in something called the boys. Who who first made this book, Nozomi-chan? She shrugged. Dunno. Ayane Mitsugane, after Shinji left. But it does. It don't matter who first wrote it. That's my hand and that's my tooth. Hikari opened the book and continued the reading. She had to fight deep within herself to be deliberately sloppy. The boys had no respect. The boss was right. Nobody wants any things to do with those who pushes the weak around. Those who would talks to them don't really give any respects. They would use the boys, and the boys wanted to be free. One day Round Boy went to the boss and said, Boss, there's this squig trying to push us around. What should we do? Stomp some respect back into him. But he knows the biggins don't like us. He says if we don't follow him, he's going to say things to the others. We's weak now. We can't do nothing because he's protected by the rules. Is that so? The boss said. Then this is what we'll do. So then the squig got to taunting Round Boy again. Round Boy asks him first to stop. The squig calls him stupid. Round Boy asks him to find his own power and leave him alone. The squig calls him fat. Round Boy asks him to go away or he's going to get thumped. The squig dares him to. Round Boy gave him such a thump. The squig would hurt and shocked, but then begins to laugh. Now you're mine, he says. I got proof. What I says now goes. That's when the boss showed himself. You ain't got nothing, he said. I saw him ask you once. He asked you twice. Three times he asked you and you refused. You's not going to say anything. No one's going to believe you, said the squig to the boss. People's going to think you're scared of round boy. Thump him again, said the boss. So the boss stand over the squig and says... You can be strong in the hand or strong in the head, but when you can't be either, then be strong in the heart. That's when you need it most. That's when you can give it to others. You's trying to steal the strength of others for your own. You fails because strength ain't something you can steal. You either has it or you don't. Your biggins always tries to think you can only be strong in one thing, not all three. We's well, going to prove them wrong. They's gonna look and they's gonna see. Get out of here, you squig. The boys don't need you. You's gonna destroy yourself one of these days. We are the boys. We are strong. And we's gonna change the world with this strength. Hikari found herself exhaling as she shut the book. She took a few deep breaths to slow down the beating of her heart. 
Kadama grinned. It's like applied morality for children, she said. Ah, sweet, no doubt must. It's simple and effective. She patted the head of her younger sibling. So you think the boss is actually real? Doesn't really matter anyway. Nozomi nodded. I... She stopped. No, the boss is for the boys. She looked up to see Hikari standing there, clutching the book to her chest. The class rep had her eyes shut and shaking almost imperceptibly. She nodded. Yep, Big Sis is strong in the heart, the head and the hand. She's figured it out already. You can only see it if you have all three. Boss, we got... Uh! The thug slid forward unconscious. Those inside reached for their weapons. As the thug kissed the floor, revealed behind her was a slight blue-haired girl. She was smiling. Oh, shit! was everyone's terrified thought. And there was much kicking of ass. Ayanami kept her AT field at an intentionally low level, just enough to barely deflect their attacks and not be detected at nerve. She never really used her AT field before, other than to float and heal herself. But Principio Eternus had taught her several more efficient uses for the light of her soul. All that was needed for her to believe, as Shinji had said for her to. She believed in him, and by his word to her, all things were possible. The leader was pressed to a wall, crying and gibbering with fear. I would like to know of hiding places in the city where one might stay underground for an extended period of time, Ray asked softly. That's... I can't, was the gang leader's reply. The others will kill me if I rat out our holes. He screamed as Ray, very casually, reached out and broke his wrist. There are many more bones in your body. I will end with your neck. Now will you provide the information, or must I need to wake someone else who will? She said in the same dispassionate tone as before. The thug nodded. Within her pocket, the farseer exulted. Not even the young king learned so quickly and so well. Orc, I take back all of what I said or fought against you. She paused. Most of it. Some of it. One or two words. The raw boss merely laughed. The girl's good, ain't she? The space marine and chaos marine could only nod, approving of her dedication. It was not a good week to be a lawbreaker in Tokyo 3. The hospitals were swamped, and so far there had been three fires and two buildings that collapsed for no readily apparent reason. The criminals were all fearfully determined not to speak out against whoever stomped on them so hard. Not only was it humiliating, it was certain no one would believe them. Kensuke worked at the bookstore under full approval of his father. The two had that generation gap, but at least were not longer quite so confused by each other. The reason the elder Ida could be so content with working with numbers was because of the things he'd seen people do during Second Impact. He just could not understand his boy's fascination with instruments of death. The glasses-wearing teen got a check in the mail as advance salary. The first thing he did was buy a white hooded jacket and gave the rest to his father to deposit in the bank. They shared something now, to defend, not to attack, to help save lives, not end them. Kensuke called home from the bookstore phone and said to his father he won't be coming home for a while. It was approved. A bookstore nearby was much better than one of the long fantasy camping trips he used to take. Kensuke didn't go to class. His father made the appropriate excuses. Packages arrived every day. Most were aptly enough, books. Kensuke bought out the ones most interesting, with a mind to actually getting the store to open someday. The ones on engineering, machinery and military equipment were set aside. One of the boxes, marked Children's Fairy Tales, had inside a smaller container made out of tough black plastic. He opened it up, and inside that were large silvery slugs, 36 of them. Bolt rounds. Real, deadly bolt rounds. It was shipped from Shinji's hometown courtesy of its police department. Ayane, so far from her own emotion charged fairy of those years ago, was incredibly persuasive when she wanted to be. Not that her father and the gunsmiths he knew needed much convincing. Kensuke saw his vision muddy again, from angry tears. He closed up shop and rushed down to the basement. He ran through the connecting door and towards the machine shop. In there, surrounded by sound-dampening walls, he let out a scream. He threw down a wrench, chipping off the reinforced concrete and sending a loud clang around the room. Damn it, Shinji, he whispered. You've just got to be all right. 
He'd sent out the recording he'd found, and it was horrendous having to listen through it over and over, just to make sure he'd chosen the important overheard pieces. He took out the Adeptus Mechanicus figurine. Let not anger cloud your mind, he could nearly hear it say. There is much work to be done. The machine spirits require your attention. Kensuke walked over to the table and a wooden model Shinji had already made. He opened up the official bolter plant. He looked at the half-finished metal casing he'd done so far. Notebooks, drawings, all the things the boys had done in that rooftop. He'd taken it, duplicated and put to safety. So many things, Shinji. The machine spirits would be well pleased with their new forms. Someday, he hoped. Someday, let them all be used. Let their anger be unleashed upon your enemies. Maya sat alone in the dark, crying. It was almost a week since she was taken. She felt cold and lost and so utterly helpless. Shinjikun, she breathed. The kidnappers no longer even kept them in the same room, depriving both of whatever emotional comfort they could provide each other. All pretense at civility had vanished. So far, she hadn't felt any abuse. But Maya knew it would arrive one day. The door was unlocked, a light switched on. She winced at the sudden change. Pointy Beard locked the door again. He grinned lopsidedly. It's been a long time, girl. Looks like no one really cares about you out there. Time to be useful. I guess a young boy's body isn't really built for that sort of thing. Her eyes widened. No, he can't mean Shinji-kun. Maya pulled deep into herself as Pointy Beard sat on the bed near her. He leered at her short skirt and tight white pants. Are we going to have problems? The lieutenant cried. shinji Ah, oh, the cut's been for a lot for your sake. Now don't you just feel guilty? I hate you, Maya whispered. How could you do this to another human being? She yelped as he grabbed at her arms and spoke directly to her face. Humanity this, humanity that. I've had enough of that from the boy. You're all fools. Humanity is an animal. We take what we want when we want it. The world is made for us. Wreck it or not, it's there for whoever's strong enough to take what they want. He pushed her down. She struggled, but it only seemed to excite him more. Now listen to me. The boy has given up a lot for you. Any more he dies. If they don't follow our demands, he dies. The question is... Are you ready to follow him? She whimpered. Since can Living for me. Suffering so much for my happiness. I'm sorry. Why must I be so useless? They hadn't even bothered to keep her in restraints. I can't do anything but cry. Shinjikun. Shinjikun. She felt the kidnapper's hands roll him all over her body. She just closed her eyes and let him. He even let go of her arms. I just cry when you're dead. She felt warm breath on her neck. Shinjikun! And something in her... broke. Maya sobbed. All right. She stammered, tears running freely. Please, I don't want to die. Please stop hurting Shinjikun! The kidnapper looked fiercely pleased. He stood up to unbuckle his belt, but Maya, in strange energy, got up and gently stopped him. She got off the bed, knelt in front of him and began to remove his pants herself. Pointy Beard bared his teeth in expectant glee. She pulled his pants down. Then his briefs. She stared at it, quivering. It smelled somewhat rancid. Hesitantly, she touched it. She stroked it. She opened her mouth and let out her tongue. And she punched up hard right at the scrotum. There was a squishing sound. Pointy Beard's eyes widened, and he let out a... (laughs) Maya let out a loud, pleading... Oh, please, no! She reached up, grabbed the fist hold of his shirt, and pulled him down. She head-butted up, breaking his nose. He slumped over her shoulder. I work from nerve, Maya whispered to his ear. Did you really think I wouldn't know, dear Carrie? <laughs> Maya struck at his windpipe. As he choked and gasped for breath, she screamed out, It hurts! It hurts! Then to his ears, It had better hurt you, bastard! For Shinjikun. 
She knew she wasn't strong enough to twist his neck around, so she just lashed out again and again at his throat. For Shinji-kun! He gurgled out and spat blood over her chest. <coughs> For Shinji-kun. You will not hurt him anymore. She was breathing heavily. She made loud sounds of resistance and grunting. Maya felt lightheaded. She felt like laughing. Sure, she just... She checked. Yep, she just killed a man. Something she thought she'd never do. And it all felt so right. She had thought even if being shot at, she wouldn't be able to hold a gun, and even so far as to point it at another person. She took Pointy Beard's gun and checked its ammo. She nodded. They actually saw her as that much of a non-threat. Of course, she was just pathetic little Maya Ibuki. For Shinji-kun. Please help me, what should I do? She felt as if his voice was beside her. Be what they expect, and you can predict how they'll react. She took off her bloody clothes, stripping naked. She wiped up all signs of blood and positioned the fresh corpse to what looked like a relaxed position on the bed. Maya then ran around the room, working herself into a sweat, all the while making more and more noises. After a few minutes, she let out an anguish scream. Listening through the door, she could hear laughter. She let a few more moments pass and made sure the chain latch on the door was secure. She unlocked it and cringed as she opened it part way. Um. She looked back and then again to the goons leering outside. He says he doesn't want to see your scrawny asses any more than he needs to. So if if you want your turn, she sobbed, take it somewhere else. Please, don't hurt Shinji-kun anymore. Maya thrust her hip out a little and touched her breast with her left hand. Tears glistened on her eyes. So, do you like what you see? Yeah! They all exclaimed. She unlatched the door. So come and take it. She stepped back. As she pulled open the door and they crowded through, they didn't see the gun until it was too late. Bam! Bam! Right to the chest. Her fingers ached from the unexpected recoil. BAM! Yellow's tooth managed to take a few steps inside before collapsing in a puddle of his own blood. Pig's eye gun fell from his limp fingers. Maya sneered. I don't care if I die! How could she have let herself believe her own life was of any worth unless it could be used to defend those she cared for? She swore on his pain never to be so helpless again. shinji Babyface looked at his watch and took another suck at his cigarette. It's almost midnight. Looks like your father really doesn't watch a kid. At the table a distance away, Red Nose and Baldy were playing cards. The latter had an eager look as the time ticked by. Tick. Tick. Babyface threw away the half-finished stick and brought out his gun. It's nothing personal, kid, he said. You can blame your father when you meet each other again in hell. He looked at his watch. Shinji was barely conscious. So all those plans. All the people he wanted to protect. In the end, he was just one. It was all useless. Without his Evangelion, he had no power at all. Such a waste. He grimaced. So this is how it ends. He opened his eyes as the goons began to count down from 60. He bit his tongue and spat out a dollop of blood and saliva at the floor. The kidnappers paused as they saw what he was up to. What's he doing? asked Red Nose. All if I know, replied Babyface. So trussed up, the only thing Shinji could do was to push the blood around with his nose. He could make anything big, but it was enough to have one bl- round blot. A dash. A misshapen circle around that. Below a wavy line. I'm sorry everyone, he thought. I failed after all. I'm sorry I can't live up to my promise. Ray! He shouted, his voice breaking with regret. At nerve, Shigeru shouted, Blue pattern detected! What? Ritsuko and Misato rushed to the screen. Where? It's somewhere above Tokyo 3, moving at high speed. And he frowned at how little it made sense. Below us, it's all overlapping. Detection's gone. We can't make out any precise location. Ritsuko hissed, not good. Not good at all. Bang! 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 The kidnappers all turned. 
What the hell was... asked Red Nose. Crumple smash! Dust and plaster flew everywhere as one of the basement walls crumbled inwards. There was a low humming sound, like slow, crackling lightning. Two red orbs glowed from behind the cl cloud of dust. Baldy already had his gun out and shot at whatever his, it was. His spread of bullets merely bounced off a hexagonal red pattern in the air. A blue-haired girl stepped out, her expression tight and resolute. She looked down at the ground, and there Shinji looked back at her with an expression of both relief and wonder. She felt no fear or disgust from him. She looked up and her eyebrows slightly grew closer. She stretched out her arm and twitched her fingers. The air vibrated with a noise that sounded similar to wah. Baldi abruptly went to pieces. Literally. Shinji-kun. Ray breathed. She turned to see that he had already somehow broken free of his restraints. He had baby face pinned on the ground, one hand keeping the gun away, the other at the throat. The goon struggled, but against that sudden berserker strength, he could only die. Ray didn't know what to feel as she stood there watching him strangle someone to death with his bare hands. But the closest would probably be respectful pride. And sorrow. Red Nose was trying to one Ray. She gestured, and he was nothing more than a red smear on the wall. Shinji stood up, breathing heavily. He felt filled with sudden, unnatural strength. Something laughed. He turned and smiled weakly. Hello, Ray. Politikari, Shinji-kun. I'm sorry, I was too late, she said softly. She felt fear. Now that she had revealed the angel of inner, she was his enemy as well. No, Ray, I should have believed in you. He walked towards her, limping, and her AT field broke apart at his approach. I'm never alone. I should have believed. In the other half of my soul. He fainted into her arms. Shinji-kun. Shinji-kun! Maya pushed through the rubble and into the carnage. She saw their... Ray? The girl glowed as if with an inner light. Her eyes glowed eerily. And there was Shinji! How... <laughs> At least he seemed in one piece. The kidnappers were angry indeed when they found out he was wired. He was too injured to do anything more, or have anything more be done too. All her fault. She lifted her gun. I don't know and I don't care what you are, but let him go! Ray merely looked past her to the bodies at the end of that corridor. You, Ibuki-san, you have fought for him. She nodded. You have killed for him. She nodded again, more slowly. Ray extended her other arm. Then you are my sister in battle. Please, Ibuki-san, take my hand so we may depart. Maya hesitated. She went over more to Shinji's sake than any decision on, on her part. She let Ray hug her around her bare waist and held on tight both to the smaller girl and Shinji. Ray focused her AT field again. All the upper floors may as well have been made of paper by the way she ripped right through them. Shinji woke, woke again. The cold night air hit him. He saw Tokyo 3 spread out beneath him and smiled. He felt four of the familiar voices return instantly to his mind. Ray... He mumbled, Corner 200 Higurashi Street. The girl could see it in her mind. She zoomed down at such speed no one could tell what the hell just passed. She floated them down at the storefront and broke the lock. She entered the gun shop, still unfinished, and onto the back rooms. Again with a lock broken through the controlled creative use of an AT field slicing edge. Down and down again. Maya sighed in relief as she saw the bed. She laid Shinji out on it. Ray frowned slightly. She began to undress and climb onto the bed. What are you doing? Maya asked, more in dismay than anything. Her own nudity was put out of her mind, but of others? He's going into shock. His injuries are severe. We must warm him now with our own bodies. Maya nodded and slid under the sheets as well. And for the first time she noticed, she too was so very... Tired. Shinji-kun, two voices murmured in the rushing darkness. Kensuke noticed the broken locks immediately upon morning. He ran right in, into the machine shop, and opened up a hidden stash. Good. It was still there. He jumped out of the elevator shaft, yelling, Ah! and bolted her at the ready. Maya and Ray woke up and rose out of the sheets. Sandwiched between them was Shinji. God damn you, Ikari! 
shouted Kensuke. You lucky bastard! <sighs> Maya clutched her head. Not so loud, please. It was then Kensuke realised that, yes, she is naked, but that's Maya Ibuki. There were contusions and dried blood all over Shinji's face. Oh, hi, Ray. What, what happened? Pilot Akari is severely injured. We have only just recently recovered him from his criminal detainment. Ray got out of the bed and began to pick up her clothes from the floor. Sense returned to Maya just at hearing his name. She pressed her hand to his forehead and sighed in relief. His temperature had returned to normal and he looked to be breathing normally, if still unconscious. Thank goodness, she murmured. Shinji can. She got out from the streets and patted it smooth around him. Maya yawned and stretched out. Kensuke let out a Ugh! and looked away. I'm hungry, she said. The team rushed to the refrigerator and took out a microwavable box of spaghetti. He hurriedly pushed that into a nearby microwave and tried to get his heart rate under control as he watched it spin slowly inside. He nearly jumped as the appliance let out a ding of completion. He turned and nearly slipped at seeing Maya hadn't even bothered to cover herself. He handed over the food, shaking, blushing heavily. He sat down on the floor nearby, fighting not to follow the line of her thighs up to... Head meat floor, floor meat head. Maya chuckled lightly. She supposed she could be feeling very embarrassed or in female outrage. But after everything, it seemed so very inconsequential. Even so strangely hilarious, the old Maya would have blushed and tried frantically to cover herself up. For the moment, she broke her chopsticks and began to eat. There was nothing, absolutely nothing she felt she had to be ashamed of. She looked at her own fingers, so dainty there and remembered the feel of life being crushed by them. She felt almost like gagging, but she was just too hungry. You're beautiful, you know that, she heard Kensuke say after a while. Hmm? You and Ray, he stammered and coughed. I mean, yeah, you're beautiful, but it's also the way you're beautiful. You're just sitting there like on display and it's not lewd. You're like a tiger, beautiful, awesome, but from a distance. He dared to look up and meet her eyes. Shinji, you had to kill, didn't you? You and Ray, you had to kill to defend him. She sighed. Yes. How did it feel? It was horrible. It was intoxicating. In the end, it felt like nothing at all. She looked aside to Ray and remembered the frightening spectacle. However, the other girl looked so delicate standing there in front of the microwave. Maya felt protective of her as well. You should have longed for that feeling, Aida-kun. He nodded. I think I've learned that too. I could be satisfied with just staying behind the scenes. I don't need any of that war glory. There is no glory, said Ray. There is only death. I know death. Ding! After a while, Maya said, Now I'm cold. She shivered and hugged herself, pressing her breasts together. Kensuke had to pinch his nose. Do you have any clothes around here? Kensuke shook his head. Yahoo! I mean, darn! I was supposed to protect this as a safe house, but I never got that far into it. There's a few shirts and pants, but it's across the street. He looked up. No. Yes. There is something. Let me... No, 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 no. I haven't posted on you enough, Edekin. Just tell me where it is. Over there with that... Ah! He shut his eyes as Maya abruptly stood up. He heard a giggle. No, he had his principles. He might be a pervert, but he had such respect for Ibuki san. Did you find it? Yes, it's black. Is this leather? No, it's some sort of polymer, actually. It's full body and enviro sealed, so it should be comfortable no matter what. He heard rustling and stretching sounds. It's kind of loose, Maya said. It looks familiar, Ray added. Press the button. Oh! Maya yelped as the black suit shrank and contorted to fit her body and various cold electrodes pressed to her skin. Kensuke deemed it safe enough to open his eyes. What is this? She asked him. Prototype armoured plug suit, he replied. It's supposed to be unisex and fit nearly anyone. I don't know from where or from whom Shinji gets this stuff. I just put it all aside and remind myself I might not like the answers. There were rasping sounds as Maya twisted her race from side to side. Ah, I guess I never really 
considered how tight your plug seats are, Ray? At the other girl's nod, she went over to a nearby full-length mirror. It feels so naughty in sheer black. She ran her hands over her curves. It's worse than being naked. She turned around a bit and spanked her buttocks. It was a loud frack. Kinsuke passed out with a truly impressive nosebleed. When he awoke, Shinji too was up and about. Hello, Kensuke, said the pilot. Shinji! Oh man, I'm sure glad to see you. How do you feel? I feel like crap itself, he laughed weakly. But it's getting better. It's good to see you too, Kensuke. The glasses geek looked around. Shinji sat up on the bed with the sheet still covering his stomach and below. His body was a mass of purple and red above the white cloth. Ray sat nearby, content with watching Shinji. Maya was on the floor sitting cross-legged and leaning upon its side, while reading from one of the science fiction books Kensuke stashed away as first priority in the safe house. He then looked up at the clock. No way, he was out for hours! Why didn't anyone wake me? Well, you seem so happy in your dreams, said Shinji, giggling like that. We didn't want to spoil any fantasies you might have. Hey, I resent that! I had no such thing! Shinji tapped his head. I can read your mind, you know. It's useless to lie to me. <gasps> really? Oh, shit. He looked from Ray to Maya, then frightened, up to Shinji. No. Kensuke groaned. Yeah, he just provided all the testimony against himself. Ray tensed suddenly. Shinji looked pensive, out into the distance. Say, you finished the bolter, right, Kensuke? He nodded and reached into his white jacket. The bolter was still shiny. It works, said Kensuke. Damn, it really works. I wouldn't want to be at the other end of this thing. Please give it to Maya-chan. The lieutenant put aside the amazing stories to stand up and take the gun. Her walk was that of a great predatory cat. Kensuke shook under the burning readiness of her gaze. It fit so easily into her hand, as if it was fated to belong there. The elevator descended and slid open. Two men in black suits exited. So, you're here after all, Mr. Ikari, said Agent Kentaro in such a flat, emotionless tone. Section 2, said Ray. They work for my father. Shinji sighed and closed his eyes. Maya, if they say anything at all you don't like, shoot them. Kensuke, are the garbage bags still there? Remember that one of those doors open out into the sewage line. We can easily dispose of them that way. The younger of the two agents merely whistled. Damn, Akari! I don't know what the hell you're up to, but I want in! Shinji didn't react. Ray, subdue them. Both agents looked slightly nervous as Ray got up off the bed. They felt a great weight as upon their shoulders, and both were forced to their knees, as if paying obedience to a king. You don't realise she's half-angel, right? Agent Kentaro asked. What? Kensuke yelped. Of course was Shinji's reply. She admitted as much. Portions of her DNA have been spliced with angel DNA to allow her certain... abilities. She's a product of a sick experiment by my father and his puppet masters. He opened his eyes and smiled at her. Ray stood beside him and put her hand on this, his. He squeezed it. She's human enough for me. Shinji stretched out his hand, and the agent's gun sprang out of their holsters and impossibly held up in the air between them. He closed his fists, and the weapons were so much mangled weapon metal. Seems I can synchronise with Ray as much as I can with an Evangelion. I know her, and I know she's no danger to me or humanity as a whole. He made a slight rave, and the ruined guns clattered off into the far corners of the room. Humanity's about choice. Too many have died for colour, race, creed, and the notions of what is worthy to be called a true human. And I say, he or she that chooses to be a human shall be treated as one. Agent Jiro had a sudden enlightened look. So, you could think? You could direct her ATV because she let you? He grinned. So, just by thinking about it, can you make a... Uh, fortunately, Agent Kentaro was quick enough to elbow his partner before he could say something they would all deeply and painfully regret. Impressive, Mr. Ikari, but you might have just triggered the magi senses. These were all a fire last night. Now they might have a fix on this location. Shinji lowered his hand and exhaled. No, I can't do much of what Ray can do, but by filtering it 
filtering it through my soul. I seem to have better control in the small scale. My own actions leave such a minute trace in comparison to hers for the same simple tasks. There was also that he was doing things the IT field was never meant to be doing, such as showing similarities to electromagnetic or gravity fields. But then as Ray would have it, it was all just the pure light of their souls combined. Or quantum magic. It's best not to let Ritsko sense I know of this, he thought. She's enough headaches as it is. The pressure eased and both agents got up. Maya still kept her bolter aimed at them, though. So how'd you find us? Shinji asked. We followed Mr. Ida. He seemed rather in purposeful hurry. Kensuke groaned. So obvious. He'd just broken Shinji's big rule about the safe house. The pilot frowned. So this was compromised now. Nerve could trace the property purchases to the other safe house locations. That left him with the two provided by the JSSDF, where they could hardly be considered as secure. Did you make your report yet? He asked, his tone controlled. Uh, if we say no, you're going to kill us, asked Agent Jiro. How about if we say yes? No, said his partner. Why not? Because we too must make our choice, to be considered as members of humanity rather than tools. Did you know your father was entirely unwilling to negotiate for your release? They were about to kill me when I was rescued, he nodded. So yes, your father seemed entirely convinced you wouldn't be killed. You know why? Shinji closed his eyes and took a deep breath. He frowned. He let it circuit through his mind. It's too big for a scenario. Too many variables. He opened his eyes and there was stunned disbelief. No. Impossible. He thinks I'm part of a prophecy? Agent Kentaro shrugged. If you believe in that sort of thing, then yes. Prophecies. The farseer whispered, are extremely annoying things. Angels, second impact, nerve, said Ray softly. It's all meant to be one great self-fulfilling prophecy. Shinji turned to look at her, and his expression was as that of the infinite depths. Something great and merciless swam in the darkness of his gaze. Tell me, Ray. Tell me everything. What has my father done? And so... There under the streets of Tokyo Free, she told them all that she knew about the Avers, the Angels herself, and Gendo's plans for human immortality, even though she knew that lay in wait behind him. She held back only one piece of knowledge, that part of her DNA was taken from you, Ikari, out of selfish, entirely human reasons. Kensuke was in shock. Maya lowered her bolter and looked ready to burst into tears. No, it can't be. She said in such a small voice. He was all useless. Our lives are nothing more than just stepping stones to one futile end. It's so cruel. Goddamn Gendo, snarled Agent Jiro. All this time he thought nervous to prevent another F-second impact when all along he wanted a third. Why had Gendo entrust you with all this information? Agent Kentaro asked her. It was his intention that if ever he was killed, then I would initiate third impact on my own. How? I am formed under the genetic material of Lilith, the second angel discovered by humanity. Under select conditions, I may be used to trigger a third impact. What are those conditions? Shinji asked. The first, returning to Lilith and setting her free, thereby fulfilling her wish to dissolve humanity into a new form of existence and continuing her war upon Adam. The second, being united with Adam, creating a self-harming impact that would destroy both of us, incidentally also destroying much of the Earth, and all of humanity. The third, being united with both Lilith and Adam, creating an impact that may be controllable. The end result would be a select portion of humanity shaping its next form, as unto a god. Agent Jiro. So, why should we just kill you so it can't happen? Maya raised her bolt gun. Okay, other than that, though it is a very good argument. The angels also wish to initiate an impact, to unite with Adam their mother and destroy all of humanity. They would then kill Lilith, expand upon this world and leave to seek out new worlds to tend into their form of life. Kensuke raised his hand. Isn't Adam supposed to be a man? There's a mere nomenclature decided upon by nerve. Angels have no gender. I, and Ray touched upon her room, have a human form and fuss with gender. Human with accidental angel. 
Shinji squeezed her hand again. Maya had a similar understanding expression. So your reason for being is to be used against the angels born of Adam, a weapon made of Lilith, using fire against fire? Agent Kentaro continued. No, that would be the Evangelion. My purpose has always been to initiate third impact. Then you're a risk to humanity just by existing. I am made. I am but one of many. This one you see before you contains the soul of Ayanami Rei, but it is not her only vessel. Commander Akari has provided spares that I may be used to pilot the Evangelion remotely, or as replacements in case I must die for a certain objective. Wait, you're a clone? Kensuke gasped. That's... cool? Sad? I don't know. I am going to kill my father. Ta! <laughs> Agent Jiro pointed. Now, there's an idea I like. Ray shook her head. There are yet more angels to defeat. He is still yet necessary for Nerf to function if we are to prevent a third impact. Which brings us back into the question of why you should be allowed to live. The white-haired agent withstood Shinji's glare. If you truly want humanity to survive, then is your own temporal happiness worth the indiscriminate destruction that others may use you for? I may also be used to averse an impact as it is happening. Agent Jiro grabbed his partner by the lapels. Old man, we need to get some body armor. 24 hour sniper protection. Poison test as this girl has to live! Ray raised her hand. A.T. Field. Agent Kentaro met Shinji's calculating look. He gave voice to a thought they both shared. Gendo's going to kill her as soon as she returns. Shinji nodded. No! Mai cried. I'll kill him first! I have a few more bolter molds, Kensuke added. Shinji squeezed Ray's hand again. He reached over to touch Maya's shoulders. His eyes were closed and sweat was starting to drip from his forehead. Maya san, he said, his voice acquiring an odd timber. How much access do you have to the magic? Um, I'm directly tasked on the Ritsuka Senpai to monitor and program it. You have something in mind, Mr. Kai? The aged agent asked. Shinji grit his teeth. Yes. And what's the problem? Will you work for me instead of my father? Will you trade the manipulations of one Ikari for another? The agents were silent. Shinji sat there in meditative style, as if a wise old yogi, but pale, bruised and nearly skeletal. However, his resemblance to Gendo Ikari was unmistakable. They could see the nearly fanatic dedication he pulled out from the hearts of those with him. It was frightening. Children were not meant to carry such things. Just that it could happen was harsh condemnation upon humanity itself. How far had they fallen since Second Impact? How much more sin could they possibly make? It was Agent Jiro who spoke first. Sorry, but I've got to go with my heart on this. Sorry, man, I'm with them. There's just too much wrong in this world. I've been in this business for a long time, kid. I've seen things, done things I don't ever expect to be forgiven for. Agent Kintaro sighed and took off his sunglasses. But I came in knowing I still don't understand everything about this goddamn game. Sometimes you just gotta take things on faith. I've just got faith that wherever you're heading, it's gotta be a better place than what that piece of shit nature punished you you with being your father is driving us all to roads. Behold, my bright lord, it lies before you now. This world shall cry your name. We must protect humanity. We must protect Ayanami. We swore an oath. We must embrace the faith of our battle sister Ibuki. We must prevail. Stomp the blight again, Joe. I don't know. It all seems so big, so real, so near now. I just wanted to help people. Now I've killed. I'll send others more to kill. I'm slowly turning into my father. I won't have all these people as my pawns. Then use your queens, my young king. Use your bishops, your rooks, your knights. Grant them power and protection, even as they give you might through their service. The world is yours. The future is now. Shinji opened his eyes. And let's play the great game. He tried to stand up and had to be helped to his feet by the two young women. 
My life's too small to stake on this. Let us gamble upon the fate of the world and the salvation of humanity. His mind rolled on through tomorrow. Misato, Ritzko, Toji, Fyutsky, Gendo, they would all act that way. Yes. What if? Yes. He was so small indeed. What did he really have? How could he possibly break the titanic forces arrayed against him? The only thing he had was the knowing that he knew exactly what they didn't want him to know and that they had no idea of it. Of it. We are now in a war, fighting for our own survival. He felt himself grin. He felt the adrenaline rise. He felt the purpose fill him. Let the enemies of humanity die. Let the opportunists burn. Let the betrayers punish. We have no other choice. Only we stand against oblivion. I cannot afford mercy. Father, farewell. Let the world see that I am Shinji Ikari. And I know what I must do.